Jeff Jarvis returns to the Plutopia podcast this time as we discuss his new book, The Web We Weave. Jeff explores the reactions of old mass media to the new world of online media. With The Web We Weave, I'm kind of looking at what comes after mass media. You're right. And the problem for mass media is they resent the hell out of it. They were in charge of everything. They they had hegemony over all that we saw and read, and and um, they can't stand that there are voices who were always there. They're not new voices, but voices who couldn't be heard before because they weren't represented in mass media. And so my theory about the internet, <clears throat> pardon me, is that it enabled these voices to at last have their stage, their microphone, and big old mass media run by old white men who look like me uh, have resented it. And so that bleeds into the coverage of the internet. Now, media have had many moral panics over the years, starting with novels, which were going to, which were going to destroy women's morals, and on to Nickelodeons, when the Chicago Tribune called them all to be banned because they were doing horrible things to the city of Chicago, to film, to radio, let's not forget the telegraph going back too, and then also obviously television and video games and rock lyrics and so on. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Plutopia News Network podcast featuring me, John Lepkowski, and my ongoing partner in crime, Scoop Sweeney, and our co-host, Wendy Grossman. So we're kind of like a small gang here, and our guest today is journalist and educator Jeff Jarvis, the amazing Jeff Jarvis who is here to discuss his new book. And this is what, three books in a, like a few months, I think. In a year, in a year, that's reasonable. That's amazing, that's amazing. Uh, this book is- lockdown? Uh, no, um, well, I guess I did help finish it by, by lockdown, yeah. I guess that helped. I'm this kind book of still is called, lockdown. This book is called The Web We Weave, and it's a consideration of partly the history and, and definitely the future of the internet and media. And I think Jeff's been doing really important work in understanding the transition from the print era to this sort of future that's out there that we don't really completely understand yet, where it's maybe less mass, more social, more focused on communities of information sharing and understanding, we hope. So here we go. Good summer, uh, and I guess, John. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. And I think my first question for you is like, like early in the book, you talk about how mass media sort of reacted to the mainstreaming of the internet and how it led into a kind of moral panic. I love that you talk about moral panic so much in the book. Uh, but how is this playing out? And and kind of what is the future of traditional mass media versus the other forms of media that are emerging online. I'm so glad you focused in on mass media because that's my obsession. Uh, it's what led me to write the book that you were kind enough to have me on last time to talk about, which was the Gutenberg parenthesis, which looks at the beginning of media. And it doesn't really become mass until you get to the industrialization and mechanization of print in the mid to late 1800s. Um, and right now I'm, research, I'm researching and writing a book on the history of the linotype the machine that the last machine that made that possible. And I wrote another book about magazines and magazines, the, the, the arc of the magazine really is the arc of mass media uh, from um, uh, mid, mid 1800s, but then late 1800s, the business model of it, the attention economy, we're going to lose money on the content and make it up on advertising and sell our audience's eyeballs to the advertisers. That started with Muncie's magazine when he lost money on every copy in the 1890s. Um, and that, that's the attention economy that's still on the internet. And so now with the web we weave, I'm kind of looking at what comes after mass media. You're right. And the problem for mass media is they resent the hell out of it. They were in charge of everything. They, they had hegemony over all that we saw and read and, and um, they can't stand that there are voices who were always there. They're not new voices but voices who couldn't be heard before because they weren't represented in mass media. And so my theory about the internet, <clears throat> pardon me, is that it enabled these voices to at last have their stage, their microphone, and big old mass media run by old white men who look like me 
uh, have resented it. And so that bleeds into the coverage of the internet. Now, media have had many moral panics over the years, starting with novels, which were going to, which were going to destroy women's morals, and on to Nickelodeons when the Chicago Tribune called the role to be banned because they were doing horrible things to the city of Chicago, to film, to radio, let's not forget the telegraph going back too, and then also obviously television and video games and rock lyrics and so on. And, and one time after another, media never kind of looked back at their own archives, their own clips, and realized we've done this before. We've panicked about something before. But the difference now, I think, is that the internet provides, uh, presents real obvious business challenge to old media. In fact, the internet kills the mass media business model because having volume for the sake of volume is no longer what media are about. I think we return to a more human scale Big old media hate that. Their coverage is constantly against the internet. So finally, I thought somebody had to write a defense, not of the internet companies, but of internet freedoms. Yeah, it's kind of interesting lately. There's been, a, we've been talking a lot about the New York Times lately and the New York Times is starting to feel kind of old and tired to a lot of people. And they're getting a lot of criticism for their, failure to understand the emergency. And I'm sure you know what emergency I'm talking about. So one thing that we have is that we have other other kinds of media, which are mostly more like social media, but then we have podcasts, we're kind of somewhere in between, where a lot of the attention is going now. So they're really use, losing mind share. I know there's 10 million people subscribing to the New York Times, but I'm getting the sense that people are reading them less and less and are starting to get their news from more like a, a, a kind of explosion of other sources, right? Uh, yeah, the 10 million number of the Times includes the people. I mean, the Times has gone through shrinkflation, right? You had a subscription that included everything, and then they took away sports, they took away food, they took away games, um, and you had to pay for those things separately. So the 10 million includes all those subscribers. Uh, it's also a winner-take-most market. So the Times... The Journal and the Washington Post get two thirds of all digital news subscriptions in the U.S., and and the rest split all of the rest. So yes, I think the Times is um, somewhat resentful of that. It doesn't know quite what to do with it. But there's also an interesting change too, John, that uh, my friend Jay Rosen at New York University noted in 2017. He said that was the time when um, he wrote at the time that the primary subscription of the Times shifted from advertising to subscriber. In other words, we, we were going back on Frank Muncy's business model of losing money on the content, making it on a subscription. It shifted over where subscription became the primary uh, support. And Jay at the time said, this is going to do something to the relationship of the newsroom to the public. And lately, my theory adding on that is we see A.G. Salzberger, the sixth generation publisher of the Times, constantly talks about being independent. And I think independent of whom? I think that the Times is trying to prove that it's independent of its readers. You don't own us. You see, if we piss you off all the time, you can see that you don't own us. Um, and they recognize that their readers are liberal and they're pissing off liberal readers. And the problem is, I couldn't agree more with you, we are in a crisis right now. We are in a crisis of fascism at the door and the Times is not covering it as fascism. Neither are they covering the racism as racism. The, the bilious a uh, meme of cats and dogs in Springfield, Ohio, is, as the Times' own um, uh, Jamel Bowie has pointed out, a blood libel that the Times doesn't, he does write about that way, but they don't write about that way. They're missing, I think, the story of the time. And media critics, I think, are missing the story of the time and the liberal anger with the incumbent institutions of media. Uh, I, I'm on a podcast that hasn't come out yet with David Fulkenflik of NPR, where I keep pressing him to do that story, and he just keeps defending big old media. Um, uh, NPR interviewed Joe Kahn of the Times a few days ago and asked him, well, yeah, liberals are mad at you, and he came you know, with two defensive answers, and that was that. It's a big story about media that's not being covered. Yeah, and I, I, I think the... The really huge, huge looming question over all of this is where is the authority for truth? 
And uh, I can't figure that out. I mean, where are you going to look to get an authoritative source? There is none right now. You know, uh, at least there's none that people was agree there on. Ever? Was there ever, though? Like when 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 Queen Elizabeth died, there there was I, I forget who it was, but it was someone from one of the formerly British colonies, you know, uh, who who made some comments about, well, it's not our queen that died. And people were really offended, but she was trying to get across that, you know, somebody who was formerly colonized by the British monarchy was not going to view the queen in the same way as, you know, your, your sort of white English person who, who's, and even working class people in this country, uh, Richard Bartle, who wrote the first online uh, multiplayer game, you know, one of the reasons he wrote it was to give people a chance to experiment with their identity. And he said, you know, a lot of the, the, the power in this country was not, was not, it's not my king, it's not my royal family, you know, because they felt, you know, as a working class person, he felt completely alienated from the power structures. So, you know, what's an authority? Yeah, Wendy, I, th I, think, I think you're right. I, I don't think there ever was one authority. There was the myth that there was one. When Walter Cronkite uh, said, and that's the way it is, for many Americans, it wasn't the way it was. Uh, if you were black or Latino or an immigrant or LGBTQ or disabled, it didn't, didn't present the world that you thought. But the mass media presented this idea that it could be one thing for everybody. And I think that is a myth that we get past now. Uh, I, I go back, I hearken back to, to, I don't know if we mentioned this last time we talked, uh, Harper's Magazine in its first issue in the 1850. Uh, as steam-powered presses were increasing the volume of media dramatically, they said, basically, somebody's got to come along and find the good shit. They didn't say it that way. They said it more elegantly. But um, uh, their first mission was curatorial, to recognize that there were multiple sources of authority, experience, expertise, and they were going to try to find that for us. Um, it changed, obviously, as Harper's decided to be its own voice. But I, I ask, where is that Harper's of 1850 for today? And it won't be one authority, it won't be one voice, but we do have, amongst all the added chaff, we have more wheat out there. We have new artistry and new authority and new lived experiences. And that's what the internet enables. And I think there's a huge business opportunity and cultural need to find those measures of authority. But John, just to, back to your point about what we do about authority, there's been facts and, and information. I fell into the trap, and I think it was a bit of a trap after the 2016 election of thinking, oh my God, disinformation is, is, is everything. And I raised a bunch of money and funded a bunch of things like fact checking and all kinds of stuff. And that was fine. I don't, I don't, I don't regret any of that. But I think that it's not a matter of information and facts that's, that's disturbing us now. I think when people say that they believe crazy stuff, noxious stuff like people eating cats and dogs in Springfield, it's not that they believe it. It's instead their signaling, their loyalty test. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, and so if we try to go after and say, well, facts will cure this, or how do we get their belief system to be different? No, Hannah Arat would teach us that it's people who are alienated from their communities and in that alienation are vulnerable to the siren call of the authoritarian, the fascist, the cult. And I think that's where we are now. So I don't know how to build a, a journalism of belonging. <laughs> When I first started blogging 25 years ago, we were saying that the blogs would capture multiple perspectives and that people would be exposed to those perspectives and that the truth would emerge from those perspectives so that instead of having a single source that told you what they believe the truth is, you would get multiple sources and then you would sort of work it out for yourself what's true. But that seems to have been... That thinking seems to have been lost. I think it was it was kind of idealistic. And maybe we were too idealistic then. I wonder if we're too cynical now. <laughs> well, in the web we weave, my big mea culpa and confession is that I I didn't abandon my blog. I started my blog right after the World Trade Center attack when I was there. Um, but Twitter ruined me for the blog because I had a thought and now I could just throw it out on Twitter and get into an immediate conversation and it was gratifying. 
and I moved some portion, some little tiny portion of my piece of public discourse to a company that was good at the time, but then could be vulnerable to take over by the noxious nihilistic nihilist that is Elon Musk. And my regret is that I didn't support the open internet sufficiently. That uh, Leo Laporte, the host of This Week in Google, has been telling me for years how wonderful Mastodon is, and I didn't pay attention to him until Musk bought Twitter. And I, I didn't pay enough attention to my blog. Uh, I still use other platforms, but Dave Weiner, who was you know, an inventor of so many of these early open technologies, said, always put your stuff on your blog too. So you maintain that, and I do now. Um, but I think that the beauty of the internet is its openness, its federation, its different architecture that cannot be bought or stopped by one party unless it's one country. Um, and I think that the companies that came along built some important things. Google built lots of important things. Twitter was wonderful in its time. I think it was fun. But to, um, to devote too much of our internet experience to these corporations makes them vulnerable. Yeah, I used to work in a uh, industry that uh, it's it's now pretty much dead, and that was radio news. And uh, I left uh, commercial radio news because I felt that big money, the big oil companies and manufacturers and retail chains were determining what was really being put on the news because I was told many times, well, you can't do that story because that's going to offend our advertisers. So I moved to Pacifica Radio, which is listener-sponsored. And we were at the station in Houston that got bombed twice by the Ku Klux Klan. And <laughs> that was a different kind of censorship. But I found out that there was even big money influencing our news there because I went on a campaign to get a guy released from prison who was set up by the Houston police. And big money liberals in Houston started to complain, I'm spending too much time trying to get this innocent man released. It's like, I heard that and I went, okay, I'm gone. And I left Houston. <laughs> but that's kind of the story of what's happened to information is the big money seems to always put its thumb on the scales. I, I tell my students, my journalism students, and I'm now emeritus from CUNY. I'm going to announce going to two other universities in a few days. Um, but for the 18 years I, I taught there, I taught the students that every single source of money brings conflict. And the job of the journalist is to understand how, ethically, is to learn how to, how to manage that and to hold our heads high that we serve the public first and foremost with independence. Uh, obviously, a lot of that has been lost. But I have hope, Scoop, for my, my students in the engagement journalism program that I started with my colleague, Carrie Brown. Frankly, the school's pretty much ruined it, but Carrie has gone to Montclair State University where she's reinvigorating it. Um, those students, I, I always told them that they're the, the, the Trojan horses that would go into newsrooms and change them. And they're doing that in many cases. And it's, it's heartening to see. I, I have some hope for the future. If I didn't, I'd be a fraud teaching journalism school. I'm th I'm, I, was, I was just thinking, I, you know, I said that I thought that people were sort of seeing the New York Times as old and tired and done for. But I was also thinking about how when Facebook first appeared, I can't tell you how many times I predicted the demise of Facebook. And every time I pointed to something that Facebook had done that I thought was going to destroy it, they fixed it. <laughs> so maybe the New York Times will figure it out. Maybe they'll fix whatever it is they need to fix. You think Facebook fixed things? My impression is that Facebook has gone along just sort of saying, actually, people don't really care that much because they're going to go on using Facebook, and they've basically ignored the complaints. Well, I, I don't think ultimately that Facebook became a wonderful thing. I think that there's a lot of issues with Facebook, but I'm just saying that as various steps along the way, they would have something that just was turning, was going to turn users off. And then uh, Zuckerberg would come out and say, oh, well, we realize that people don't like this. We're going to change it. You know, I mean, the thing is that these things can change, especially if they think that, that, you know, they're going to either disappear or, you know, lose a great deal of money. 
well, by persisting with what they've got. Well, Zuckerberg has said he's not going to apologize anymore. So <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> well, he never meant any of the apologies, <laughs> as far as I can tell. Um, you know, one thing I write about in the web we weave is that I've long regretted that I don't think that Facebook had a North Star, a raise on debt. Why are we here? And and I and, and I end my my book. Some will probably say Pollyannishly, not having learned anything, saying that I wish that companies and governments and and academics and users would all have covenants of mutual obligation. Facebook's uh, terms of use governed the users, not Facebook. It presented no expectation of what Facebook would do. I want these companies to say, this is what you can expect of us. This is why we're here. This is what we're going to hold ourselves to and you to. And it would have made it a lot easier, I think, in in the culture of Facebook over the years, if we could have pointed to something and saying, oh, no, 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 you're, you're, you're being awful now. You're being nasty. You have to stop that. Reddit, which is no wonderland of civility in all cases, but Reddit kind of figured that out where they, they said that each subreddit has its own rules and what's relevant there and kind of allowed there and became self-governing in a way. And doesn't mean there aren't some awful ones along the way, always have been. Um, but, but Facebook didn't have that. Mike Masnick, brilliant uh, proprietor of TechDirt, uh, often says that um, moderating content or speech at scale is an impossibility. Um, he calls it Masnick's uh, impossibility theorem. Um, he expresses it better than I just did. And I think that's true. And I think what, what happens, uh, Wendy, with Facebook is that ex judgments are expensive. You don't want to make judgments because I Facebook, but i think facebook was quite clear what it was for when it began it's yeah but it parties. was for the users when it began i mean it was kind of built for the users well, actually, but what was happened great, was great women first of all but w when you build something like that you build it for the users you get a whole lot of users and you look at that set of users let's say you've got millions of users at this point that's a resource that you can sell. That's attention. So what they started doing and what all the other social media platforms were kind of sucked into trying to do is sell attention. So the user became the product rather than, you know, the, the customer. And I think that's a lot of what's wrong with social media right now. I'm not sure how you fix it, but... I mean, if you build a social media platform and it's really successful, though, I, Jeff, in your book, you talk a lot about building smaller. And I think that that, that is inherently the way to go. This goes back to your first point about the mass. I think the mass as an idea, and I write about this in the Gutenberg parenthesis, is fundamentally an insult to the public. It's a way not to listen to people, not to understand them as individuals or members of community, to put them in big buckets and treat them as such. And I think that it was at that point of the mechanization and industrialization of print and then broadcast, certainly, where we were turned into a mass. Certainly, there were things before that where the, you know, the French Revolution feared the mob, uh, which is, I think, analogous in many ways. But the, the stat I love best from, from all my research is that before the mechanization and industrialization of print with steam-powered presses and the linotype and cheap paper and so on, the average circulation of a daily newspaper in the United States was 4,000. It was a good Substack newsletter. If you had a Substack newsletter at 4,000 with 20 bucks each, you, you have a good business. Um, down here on my little book cart, ah, I have, uh, since you, th you three can see me, a book that is in the newspaper directory of 1900. It's three inches thick and very heavy. And in New York at the time, there were a few score daily newspapers. And that wasn't fragmentation. That's what mass media people say when you get choice. That was instead a more focused media ecosystem where people had the publications that spoke to their needs and those publications argued with each other. And I think that's a healthier structure than what we have today of monopolistic uh, mass media. And so, yes, I hope we return to something at small scale. And the paradox of the internet is that because it is so big, it enables small to be big enough. 
That is to say that before, if you want to make your Austin's favorite jam company jelly and wanted to sell it, you, you had to afford getting onto grocery store shelves or buying ads in newspapers or magazines, and you couldn't. Now you can go on Google and you can find the enough fans of your jalapeno jelly to sell it and small is big enough or you can have a Substack newsletter or a podcast and it's big enough and you decide what's big enough. I know the three of you have made a fortune off Plutopia <laughs> and, uh, and it's made you wealthy beyond your, your wildest dreams, but you decided what's big enough to keep doing this because you enjoy it because it matters. And I think that's a wonderful um, affordance of the net. Well, I didn't realize I was wealthy now. <laughs> I'm not going to go out and buy that uh, that Tesla. No, no maybe I'll. No, no, please don't. No, please no. <laughs> if, don't. If they don't, they don't share with me. It's really their their operation. <laughs> they, they yeah. the well, you, just get a Lamborghini. Yeah. Jeff, you wrote about uh, regulation. Is regulation going to cure all of our ills in the internet and social media? Because I noticed that the that China, the home of TikTok, is trying to regulate unauthorized use of language they are confused by all the abbreviations and slang that's popping up on the internet in uh in china is particularly in TikTok. i i can't even understand a lot of the thing, the slang but that's an example of you know an attempt to uh regulate language is that ever going to be possible i hope not but uh People that keep trying. I hope not too. I was just about to get to an argument with somebody I know on, on Twitter. I refuse to call it X um, about Section 230, which is the legislation that that gives some safe harbor to platforms, both to enable them to allow speech without being liable for everyone's speech on it and to be able to moderate that speech according to their own views. And I think it's I think it's wonderful legislation, but people come after all the time from the right and the left and say, oh my God, the internet's horrible, something must be done. We've got to change or get rid of section 230. And I say, no, stop. Um, we have a first amendment in, in the US and it enables speech. Uh, it enables obnoxious speech too. Uh, I'm old enough to remember um, the Nazis uh, marching in Skokie, which couldn't have been more noxious, but we, in our heritage of the First Amendment said we will defend even that. Um, and, and so I think we've got to keep that in mind. And the idea that government should impose its sense of propriety or civility on the public is a matter of white power and privilege and male power and privilege. Uh, witness the fact that the Comstock Act is now being cited again as an effort to get rid of abortion and abortion materials in this country because it was one white man who decided what was going to be civil and decent for all women in the United States. That's what you open the door to. And you open the door to saying, oh, the speech is bad and something must be done. No, we can all turn it off to an extent. Now that's, that's again, easy for me to say as a privileged white man, um, if you're a vulnerable class or a woman or um, uh, a, a underrepresented group online, you are more vulnerable than I am to harassment. And those are issues and those are things we've got to deal with. But those are the norms of society. We all have an obligation to do something about that. I don't think most people understand Section 230 very well, but what it really does is it, it makes, it gives a accountability, responsibility for something to the person who did it. You know, it's like uh, if you're Twitter, you shouldn't have to be responsible or X. OK, Twitter or X. It's Twitter. You it's Twitter. Damn it. It's Twitter. Twitter. I, I like if you're Mike Twitter. Masnick's, I like Mike Masnick's. He, he uses he calls it X Twitter. Yes. EX Twitter. But you shouldn't have to if you're a platform, you shouldn't have to take responsibility for something that one of your users has done on your platform. So Section 230 to me is like eminently reasonable. And if you do away with it, you also do away with the platforms or if the platforms yes. exist at all, they become publishers and not platforms for users, you know. When you go to a place like The Guardian, when they started um comment is free uh they put because because the uk doesn't have a first amendment they put themselves at great risk 
that they could have been liable for the speech of their readers, but they believed that that speech was valuable. You know, th this question of, of responsibility fascinates me these days because I'm seeing a parallel discussion with responsibility in AI going back to responsibility in print. This will take just a second. So the discussion in AI is, and, and there was, uh, Gavin Newsom in California just vetoed a bill that would have held the model makers, OpenAI and Google and perplexity and such, responsible for everything that could be done with those models. That's foolhardy because it's a general machine and, and like a printing press. And how can you, how can you predict everything bad that any malign actor could ever make your tool do? And so it's fooling yourself to think that, oh, we've made it safe now. But there, so this is the model maker. But that's the first reflex. Think back to the printing press. The, pr the technologist, the printer, was held responsible for what came off the press. They were beheaded and beheaded and, and, and behanded and burned at the stake for what came off the press because they were responsible. Then next, it was the intermediaries. In the age of print, it was the bookseller or the publisher. In the age of AI, it's the, it's the application. And then finally, it was the user or the author, right? And, and so in the age of print, Foucault would say that once authors were held responsible for what they, they said, that was the birth of the author. And then today you have, if a user uses AI to make porn or the lawyer, the famous lawyer whose case I covered, uh, who got uh, ChatGPT to give him ca case citations, it was his fault. It wasn't the machine's fault. He misused it and didn't do his job. And so there's this reflex to have responsibility at this high level. If we can just fix the technology, everything will be okay. And then, and then we try to find intermediaries because government can't scale. But finally, we've got to recognize that we are all responsible and we've got to figure that out. I, I don't know if you're aware that in the UK, the bookstore that sells a mag magazine with a libel in it can be held liable also. And so there's libel law in the UK is is quite a different thing. And there's a lot of people who are actually quite frightened of English libel law. Yes. And what The Guardian did very sensibly is they had moderators, right. human moderators. And they and if you notice, they are now selective in which articles have comment boards and which don't. And part of that is that that some of them turned into real sinkholes and rather than rather than have moderators have to deal with all the abuse, they just simply decided that certain topics and certain kinds of articles just don't get comment boards. But the other thing is in what you said that interests me is that a lot of what people are doing with AI is not speech. Uh, you know, the, the, the EU's AI Act is not really aimed at curbing what what it doesn't try to curb what generative AI can do. What it tries to do is ensure that systems that are put in place that are making decisions about people's lives are constructed with some some aspect, some element of fairness and that people have the right to redress. And I think that, you know, that seems to me a good thing. I don't think that's bad regulation. Yeah, I think the, the European AI uh, legislation was going to be bad, but turned out pretty well. Can we just can we just give some kudos to the European Digital uh, Rights Initiative for that, Edri, because they put a mm -hmm. lot of work into uh, in, into helping make it better. Yeah, one thing that, that was rumored that they were going to do was outlaw open source, because there are those who believe that if you make open source, then bad actors can come along, get around the guardrails, do anything they want with it. But of course, that only puts the power then in the hands of the few oligopolies that can that can afford both the technology and the liability uh, around this. And so open source, I think, is critical to creating more competition, more awareness, uh, more experimentation, and, um, and allowing smaller players like universities to, to, to do things. I, I'm inspired by, uh, in, in Norway, Shipstead, the, the, the big publisher, brought together all of digital media in Norway and said, let's all contribute our content to the making of a Norwegian language LLM. And we'll figure out the business model later, but let's just get, let's just get our act together and do that collaboratively and work with the university to build it using uh, as the base Mistral, which is open source from France. That's a nice model of what works here. I think it's large companies, universities, researchers, small people coming together to do something collaboratively. Uh, that's not happening in the U.S., uh, and I'm very glad that the EU legislation did not cut that off. It would have been.
been a remarkable thing to do when you consider that, you know, people complain that the EU doesn't, the EU system doesn't produce unicorns. There are no billion dollar, where are the billion dollar companies? But actually, you know, the web was founded in CERN. Uh, Linux was Finnish. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the Raspberry Pi was, you know, I mean, if you look Great around. Point. What the what the Europe has been really good at is creating tech is creating is open source stuff that creates a trillion dollar markets. So I, I find it very peculiar to see Americans going, oh, you know, Europe never produced a billion dollar company. Well, no. Well, I hear I hear Germans complain a lot about that, that, that oh, America has all these huge companies or the, the French. The French said, you know, we have to have our own Google. Well, no, that's yesterday's war. Create the next thing. That's Mistral is a greater contribution than a second Google. Speaking of the next thing, uh, oh, John, you had something. I was just going to say it's not necessarily a good thing to have those huge companies. No, actually, that. Was, but the next thing is something that interested me in reading the book, which is that uh, through a lot of it, you talk about the internet when you're really talking about the web. And there are mm -hmm. lots of applications mm -hmm. that run on the internet that are not the web. You yes. know, traditionally, and I know you know this. Direct messaging, IRC, uh, Usenet was in fact predated the internet. It was computers calling each other and got carried over the internet. And you know the web itself had competitors, which basically lost out because they wanted to charge money, and the web was given away for free. Um, but if we were th trying to imagine the future of the internet, what are do we have it? Do you have any idea what kinds of applications that are not the web? That might be something genuinely new. Now, it always seems to me that the thing that the internet is good at is that its unique feature is many-to-many -many communication. And so I, I, you know, and for for a while, people talked a lot about IP IPTV, like people were going to be able to have television channels from their homes, not via YouTube, but like directly, you know, sort of hosting a channel for their families and stuff. And that hasn't really happened, other than with Zoom calls, <laughs> but. But, um, you know, it's an interesting thing to speculate about, like what would be the next killer application after the web? I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great question, which as I tell my students is always the way that New Yorkers and professors buy time to find an answer. Um, I, I'm seeing the, 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 the internet, the web and AI as a bit of a continuum. I'm not saying AI is the they plus ultra of it. I'm just saying that, it, that they're connected because the connectivity is what enables it. Um, in media terms, I think the progression was from a destination strategy. You have to come to me and my newsstand to buy my publication to get anything that lasted for centuries. And then we came to a search uh, paradigm. You can look for anything. And then a social paradigm, you could recommend anything. ChatGPT is a queried paradigm. You can ask for anything. But then I think the next thing is agents. And for us to be able to go out and say, let me know when this happens or do this for me. Now, the present state of ChatGPT, I wouldn't trust it to do that for a second. Um, but I can imagine for certain tasks, uh, an ag agentive, I think that's the proper adjective, um, world, uh, opens up some interesting new possibilities. Go do this for me. Where if you were a programmer, you could do that. You could write the program. Well, but now you don't have to. Now you can tell the machine to do pretty amazing things um, without expertise, all of which I kind of throw under an agentic, agentive uh, umbrella. I don't know that that's a good answer, Wendy, at all, but I think it, it, it we have to look at new paradigm shifts. I also, long, long ago, I worked for Delphi Internet mm -hmm. for one yeah. weird month. Uh, it was the first mechanism to get consumers onto the internet when it was still monospaced green screen. And there was a um, paradigm jar there. If you said paradigm in the day, you had to throw $5. In. <laughs> it was an expensive word to say. So I've just, I just owe you $10. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that you're asking the exact right question is uh, the web is, was so much seen in media terms, right? There were pages. Well, everybody could probably kind of imagine the web as the thing they wanted it to be, right? Like, so if you were a mm -hmm. publisher, the web looked like a publishing medium. And if you were a yes. broadcaster, it looked like a broadcast medium. Yes. And, 
And and if, if you you're were, an advertiser, it looked like an advertiser medium. And if you were a bulletin board, if you were the survivor of bulletin board systems, it looked like a bulletin board. Yeah. Yeah. And it is all of those things. And it is all of those things. But, you know, I mean, I, when did I, I think I start, first started hearing about agents in, 19, in 1998 or something exactly. like that. You had people saying, oh, you know, your agent is going to go out and find your, find your, the best plane ticket and all this stuff. I wouldn't trust a bit of software to find the right plane ticket. Would you? I mean, you know. Well, they called them intelligent agents, but they weren't always. In no. fact, they usually weren't. Yes. No. Uh, I agree. I wouldn't trust them either. Uh, I went to, so I'm part of a World Economic Forum uh, AI governance thing. And I, and I went to the first event in San Francisco and there was an executive from um, Salesforce who said, you don't release agents until you trust them. And I don't think we've reached that point of trust. At some point for certain tasks, I can imagine. Have you guys played with Notebook LM at all? I haven't. I've been hearing about it, but I haven't dipped it's into it. It's quite wonderful. And, and one of the best things about it is they, Stephen Johnson is a wonderful author who, if you haven't had him on your podcast, you should. Um, yeah, I actually know Stephen from years, years ago. He's great. And they, Google hired him as the editorial director of Notebook LM. I can't imagine that title exists anywhere else in Google or Silicon Valley. Um, but the intention was to help writers where you could put a whole bunch of files in there and then query just that data. It wasn't the whole stupidity of AI. You were asking just that data. And so it would summarize it or give you a glossary or give you a table of contents. Well, the latest trick, and it's a parlor trick, is, and you probably heard, you can put in uh, some piece of data and it will produce a podcast. And I put in the entire uh, manuscript from the web we weave, and it gave me back about eight minutes of two fake people talking about the book. And it was actually a pretty good summary. And it was filled with all kinds of ridiculous visit, uh, you know, oral tics, so, ha, 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 laughing and, oh, that's funny. Um, and saying, um, and things like that to try to prove their humanity, which is weird in its own way. But as a parlor trick goes, it's pretty amazing. And so I could imagine. What are they going to do for the follow-up live show? Because the the successful podcasts these days all have live tours of live shows. You know, I beg your pardon. You, you get Alistair Campbell and Rory Stewart sitting on stage at the Odeon in London right, for you know, right. a couple hours. I mean, it's insane. <laughs> oh, we so should absolutely do that. Show. Actually, I was thinking the other day about doing a live Plutopia. Um, I don't know. Well, Maybe could we could do it at, do it at South, South, by, South. Do it at South yeah. by Southwest. Yeah, South by Southwest. Yeah, that's yeah. very doable. Well, so I have one issue I want to raise, and that's energy. Mm -hmm. AI is a huge consumer of energy, and and there's much concern. In fact, I've seen people absolutely freaking out about the the footprint of AI systems and the amount of energy they are using and my argument has been because i'm i'm you know i'm sort of on board with ai for the most part but i have argued that ai programmers will work to make those systems more energy efficient but i'm and i'm saying that because I know it's actually happening. I mean, I know there's actually conversations about doing that, but at the same time, I wonder about it. And I wonder if we may build systems that are just too energy intensive for ongoing persistent use. Especially for the value that they deliver. If it, it you know, God knows how many, you know, tree, how many oil wells had to burn to do my little podcast of my book. Um, I often cite what I think is a seminal work in AI, which is the Stochastic Parrots paper by Tim Nitt, Gebru, Margaret Mitchell, um, Emily Bender, and the fourth person whose name I always forget, the fifth Peter. And one. I do too, Angelina, isn't Thank it? Thank you, yes, but I forget. Uh, something. I feel awful. Ma she, something she's, major. She's, yeah, she's Emily Bender's student. She was. Um, anyway, it pointed out these present tense issues with AI, le leading with environmental damage and energy, also labor issues, also obviously bias. And these are the things that need attention. What disturbs me, and I write about this in the book, is the distraction 
that's coming from the AI boys and their boys uh, about their their uh, doomerism and thinking that what really matters instead is the 10 to the 54th huge future human beings and all the BS of long-termism and effective altruism and transhumanism and their fake philosophies that Tim Nick Gebru writes about with um, Emil Torres. They've done really great work on what they call Tescriel. So um, one thing they pointed out in Stochastic Parrots, I only wish it were easier to say, is that this kind of male size matters view of the ever bigger model run on ever bigger machines is pointless because it doesn't necessarily do anything smarter and highly damaging because you, it makes it much harder to then audit what goes into them and to understand the biases that occur as well as being damaged to the environment. And so I think that, that, that small models are much more interesting. And Jan LeCun, who's at Meta, who I think is a much more sane AI executive, um, pushes the small versions of Llama, of, of, of Facebooks. And so I hope, just like media, that AI figures out how to go small. And the thing that might drive that is our phones, because they're putting AI models directly on our phones now with chips that can handle it. And I think that might um, motivate a downsizing of this hypersized view, worldview of AI. I looked at that name you guys couldn't recall, and it's Angelina McMillan Major. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that kind of makes me think about the idea of small nuclear uh, <laughs> devices to generate nuclear energy versus these massive. Uh, and who was it that just that they were just going to what were they buying? Three Mile Island or something like that? And they were going to Microsoft. Microsoft. Microsoft is, yeah, is, Microsoft. Is, yeah. yeah. So, so I, you know, maybe that's the solution to our uh, our energy problem with AI. <laughs> I don't know, actually, but the small the small language model idea. A, a friend and I, a friend named John Crowcroft, who is a security guy at Cambridge and works at the Turing Institute in London, uh, and I actually wrote a, a small paper about that idea a couple of, summer of twenty twenty three, just before, mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Um, but but the thing that it strikes me is that you know what i would like is the personalized model that has read everything i've read and has read everything i've written and that yep. i can then query you know sort of a, my little intellectual universe but the thing that that's really like is vannevar bush's idea yep. in in 1945 of the memex but the thing is when you go back and you read vannevar bush's paper it's really interesting because it relied on okay i mean it talked about microfilm and and film cameras and stuff like that because that was the period he lived in but the thing that really really has dated badly is his idea that he would have you know sort of a hundred secretaries <laughs> who, would be, <laughs> who would be labeling all this content but the fact is that that's what ai is is hundreds of secretaries we don't call them secretaries and they live in in the global south and we pay them very badly but that's what ai is to a large extent is these people labeling content and labeling data and it's you know it's very close to his original vision uh, let, let me let me ran on two things there one is I, I think that there's there's the chance for ai to be a creative tool uh, Lev Manovich, City University Graduate Center, is, is working on a, a book about, about whether AI has an aesthetic, and he's using it and experimenting with it. I just wrote a syllabus for a course I'll probably teach at a different university on AI and creativity, and to see how the students could use AI as a means to help them express themselves in the way they want to without necessarily being homogenized into all the expression past. Um, but, but to your second point, Wendy, about, about the secretaries, so I'm I'm halfway through writing my book about the linotype. Now you're you're all old enough to know what a linotype was, right? Okay. Oh well, yeah, I spent some time around some linotype machines when I worked for a typesetter in my youth. Bingo! And I when I worked for the Chicago Tribune, my first stories were set on the linotype. My father. Uh, was however, if I say to people under the age of, well, I won't say because we're all under the age we want to be. Um, they don't know what the hell it is. Anyway, a quick little rabbit hole here. The the uh, inventor of the linotype was Otmar Mergenthaler, but the inspiration for it was a wonderful man named James O. Clefane. And Clefane was the fastest stenographer in Washington. 
He worked for the Secretary of State in Lincoln's cabinet. Um, he was a wonderful, wonderful character. And he, was, he, he tested the first typewriters uh, that, and beat them up and improved them. And he worked on the linotype. But in the middle, he also helped develop and invested in what became the gramophone. The gramophone was Edison's. There was another one, a, a different one um, that he was involved in, but they kind of merged. And eventually he was, a, it became Columbia Records. I thought, well, where the hell, the hell does that fit in? As I researched it, I discovered that what, what stenographers were called, they had different titles. One was reporter because the original reporting was you go and you uh, report on this speech, but they were also a recorder and they were known that the, the field was known as photography. Thus the phonograph, the phonograph was a mechanical version of what the human task was of recording events. The only way you could record speech was for someone to write it down. That was a phonographer. Well, that's like the original computers were women. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And, and it's fascinating to watch, you know, how, how typewriter, the word started as the person, a woman, and then became the machine. Yeah. Typesetter was the person and then became the machine. In Oakland, um, I worked across the street from the College of Court Reporting, and they mm -hmm. went out of business suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, and, and so this idea of being able to record what's around you, but are you merely recording it? Or are you using that as the basis to create? And that's the, that's the bridge that I think is interesting when it comes to AI. When AI, when ChatGPT came out, I speculated that we could use it to help expand literacy. And I said this to the students in the executive program I helped start, and two students, one who runs a site for First Nations people in Canada, the other one runs a site for imprisoned people in the US. And they both said, whoa, white man. Um, you, are you suggesting that you want to homogenize the speech of people into this hegemony of speech that occurred before? Because what AI gobbles up is the output of those who had the power to publish in the past. And I said, you're right, you're right. However, as a tool of creativity, if it's fully within my grasp, I can't draw. But if I want to illustrate something and it helps me say what I want to say better, I think that has utility. A lot of people are intimidated by writing. Um, and if it can help them, I think that, that becomes interesting as long as they are still authentic to themselves. Well, and you could, you could train the AI to have that kind of authenticity for that matter. Indeed, I saw, <clears throat> this goes back to your point, Wendy, as well. I went to a Bertelsmann investment conference a few months ago and, and moderated a panel. And one of the companies they were showing off lets an artist uh, and, and the artist who spoke is a, he's not, he's a cartoonist of sorts, uh, as in illustrated books. And the tool lets him put in his entire oob, trains on that. And then when he says, he said, I hate doing backgrounds, because they do background, 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 background. And it's got to change it a little bit. So he can tell the AI, use my style to make that background where he showed a demonstration, there was a shot of a seashore and he wanted to use that shot. So he just told the AI, make this into my style. And then he could edit it and it made him pay attention to what he wanted to pay attention to more, um, which I found fascinating. That's cool. We've been ta talking about, and in the book, you're talking quite a bit about, for one thing, the evolution of information, I guess, distribution and the socialization of information. And then there's a bit in there about AI. And I wonder about how those things might come together. How might AI influence the evolution of the distribution of information and the socialization of information? I don't know. I don't know. I think that, I mean, generative AI is crap at information or facts. It has no sense of meaning, no facts. It doesn't lie because it doesn't know what truth is. Um, and, and so I think that it was, a, it was a dire mistake for Microsoft first and then Google to associate generative AI with the search engine. Um, it's a dire mistake, I think, for news organizations to associate it with making stories. Um, I, I, so I, I, I don't think information at, at the generative level, and there's different kinds of AI, 
right? There's predictive AI and other AIs that may be useful in other ways, will be, are, especially in science. Um, but I don't know that they should have a role in information yet. I think part of the problem is that people are confused by generative AI when it comes to language. I don't, I don't think they have a problem when, when it's generated an, an image, they understand that it's an image that's in response to a prompt mm -hmm. and that the, the, the AI is going to get it not quite right and they're going to try to adapt the prompt. Seven when figures, they see yeah. language, when they see language, it's, you know, I think it was J Jamie Boyle who came up with, with the great line about for the first time in human history, sentences sentences don't imply sentience. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Well, except to some, it does. Yeah, I tell the story the in the book, and that's the point. We're used to the it idea shouldn't. that if something yeah. can form sentences, it's got a brain. And, and I think that's why AI with language is so, is so difficult for people to grasp that it's really just math and statistics. Mark Twain said that a machine could not set type unless it could think. Whenever we see, and Mark Twain lost a fortune, his fortune, on trying to create a machine that, that competed with um, the linotype. However, I'm promoting the next book I haven't even finished writing yet. Um, and I think that what I've seen more than once is I think that whenever a machine comes along that does something that we thought only we could do, we ascribe sentience and thought to it. And probably the worst thing we did was somebody did, and I don't know where it started. I've got to look this up. Who first coined artificial intelligence? I thought it was I thought it was McCarthy and the and, and the guys who assembled at Dartmouth in 1956. I'm gonna look that up. Thank you. Um, um, the, the 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 story was that McCarthy and Marvin Minsky and they convened this meeting, famous meeting, with with a bunch of other guys. You know, one summer in 1956, I, I knew McCarthy slightly, and I asked him once, you know, did you really did you think AI would take this long? And he said, No, I thought we'd have it wrapped up in six months. <laughs> You are quite right, Wendy. The Googles tell me artificial intelligence coined at Dartmouth, Dartmouth brags. Uh, a proposal for the Dartmouth Summer Research Project on Artificial Intelligence. Yeah, but neither McCarthy nor Minsky taught at Dartmouth. <laughs> That's, um, McCarthy is, is credited to Dartmouth here. Really? At the time, yeah. Minsky um, at Harvard. I know, I know that McCarthy was on the East Coast for a while, but he, he, most of his career, I believe, he was in San Francisco. Yeah, but and Shannon Palo, at Bell, me, Palo Bell Labs. Palo Alto. Palo Alto. Stanford. Yeah, but who's building Skynet? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Elon Musk thinks he is. Oh, God. I what mean, that's kind Skynet? of the interesting thing about AI is that, you know, if you spend some time hanging out with AI and talking to it, you realize that it's not really an intelligent... Well, there is that one guy. What, what was the name of the guy at Google who yeah. was absolutely convinced that he was talking to uh, a, a, a superior intelligence it's a lambda yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um and and but I, I tell that story in the book primarily he was uh, credulous shall we say uh he wanted to believe it but what got me more was how media wanted to believe it they went out and did stories about this guy believes it's sentient he's clearly um wrong and um shall we say, an interesting character and had other motivations going on. I don't mean that they're they're nefarious, but I just think that he he got carried away with himself. Spiritual. Uh, yeah, exactly. And the, and the Washington Post just went berserk on it. Same as Kevin Roos at the New York Times thinking that ChatGPT had fallen in love with him. And, and, and that kind of credulous coverage is damaging. Well, this is the thing I don't get because like, I mean, I remember playing with Eliza years ago, and it took me about 25 seconds to, 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 to get Eliza to do something obviously robotic. It took me less than, the, it took me about the same to get um, chat GPT to behave like a robot. Yeah. Uh, and and one of my friends is Azim. Well, I used to know him. We used to work for the Guardian at the same time, sort of. I was a freelance. Uh, Azim Azar, who mm -hmm. runs the Exponential View, right? Uh, and and he has this whole thing with perplexity.ai. So I went and tried it one time, 
and it took me it within three questions i had it i had it you know falling apart and so i don't understand how it is that these reporters do this i mean they're obviously not trying to see through it because you know, I mean, I'm an awkward kind of person. I go to a magic show and I deliberately look where the magician is trying to distract me from. Yeah. That's and why they call it perplexity. Hmm? That's why they call it perplexity. I guess. Wendy, uh, I, think, I, I think it's because they, they want to they, they want to believe it because they, they want a story. You know, the old saw in journalism is, is, is never ask too many questions. Don't ask that last question because it might ruin the story. And I, and I think that they wanted to do that, and, and it, it, it's, it ill serves the public. So this is going to be hard for everybody here to believe, but we have run out of time. Our hour is actually up. And I feel like we could probably go on for another hour or two, but we want to respect everybody's time. So, uh, Jeff, maybe we can get back together again and uh, even before the next book and talk about this some more. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love talking to you guys. This is so much fun. Thank you. Yeah, this is great. Well, thanks so much for joining us. I'll see you on stage in Austin. Yeah, absolutely. Are you coming to South by Southwest? No, but, but for you, I'd come. <laughs> uh, well, somebody should suggest that they include you as a featured speaker. And well, maybe somebody will. John and I will start working on our song and dance routine right now. <laughs> yeah, vaudeville. You know, let's bring back vaudeville. That's right on, right on. That's your next book. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. You can stay in touch with Plutopia at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, look for at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.